Hi and welcome to lesson 14. This lesson is in, on important experimental steps towards actually building quantum networks. We have talked about quantum networks in theory, now we will have two lessons where we talk about of what was actually built and implemented in terms of experiments. We're going to begin with the first experiment in step one, and that's loophole-free violation of Bell inequality. So what is, what is a Bell inequality? We're going to start with an abstract picture. Bell inequality is a test of correlations between the outputs of two boxes and their random input bits. What we mean is we have the following scenario in mind. We've got our box A and box B. What these boxes are and how they work is not important. What's important is that if we provide uh, input A to box A and input B to box B, where these inputs are classical bits, then the boxes will produce an output, X and Y. And the values of the outputs can be plus one or minus one. And we're going to repeat this procedure many times and get a statistics in order to estimate a correlation. The correlation of interest is the following. It's, it's the correlation of between X and Y given the inputs A, B. A Bell inequality is the following sum um, of these correlations. It states that uh, the following uh, combination of these correlations cannot be larger than 2 or smaller than minus 2. In other words, the absolute value of the following expression is bounded by the value 2. Now, that was the abstract picture. Let's get a little bit more physical. We can replace our boxes with qubits. In here, we replace box A with a qubit in terms of the electron spin qubit of a nitrogen vacancy centering diamond, and the same for uh, box B. And now our inputs determine the basis of measurement. When A is zero, then we measure um, the first qubit in the Z basis, and when it's one, we measure in the X basis. For qubit B, when the input B is zero, we measure in this rotated basis, minus Z plus X, and when the input B is one, we measure in the following basis, minus Z minus X. And again, the qubits will produce plus or minus one as their answers. Funnily enough, if we prepare the qubits in the right state, in this case a maximally entangled state, we measure uh, S, the Bell violation, in terms of or the value of the Bell correlation function as 2 times square root of 2, which is approximately 2.828. So we see that in this case, we actually violate Bell's inequality. We measure correlation much stronger than predicted by the Bell inequality. What's the significance of this? Why do we care? Well, there's two, two answers to this question. One, it has very fundamental implications. It says that quantum mechanics cannot be both local and realistic. What does that mean? Local means that physical influences do not propagate faster than light. This is quite natural and we can expect it from special theory of relativity. Realistic says that physical properties are defined before and independent of the observations that we use to observe our physical systems. If we observe a violation of Bell inequality, it says that one of these assumptions must be dropped. But violation of Bell inequality can be also used in very practical terms, which is really what we care about. It's useful in checking that the state is entangled. It can be used to verify that a generated quantum key is secure. It can also lead to the concept of device independence, where we can test quantum devices and that they are operating as we instruct them to do. For example, a device could even be manufactured by an eavesdropper during a QKD session. But by using device independence and by using violation of Bill inequality, we can actually place an upper bound on how much the eavesdropper can learn. And also violation of Bill inequality is very important in certifying random numbers. But in every experimental demonstration of Bell's, of violation of Bell's inequality, there were uh, so-called loopholes. So what are loopholes? Loopholes are additional assumptions used to obtain violation of Bell's inequality. For example, uh, an important or famous loophole is the locality loophole. And this means that the box must be assumed to be non-communicating. This is because box A cannot know the input of box B before its output is produced. 
and vice versa. If this is not true, then box A can just tell the uh, input to box B, and then box B can produce its output based on the information of the inputs about B and A. In such a scenario, the Bell inequality simply does not apply anymore. So it doesn't make sense to violate Bell inequality. One way of um, closing this loophole or violate, um, avoiding um, this locality loophole is to separate the systems far enough. They can only communicate maximally at the speed of light. So if they're far enough, then we have some time window of ensuring that A cannot communicate its input to B before system B produces its output, and vice versa. Um, here is a space-time diagram that demonstrates this, um, this principle of how to close the locality loophole. On the horizontal axis, we've got space, and here we've got our boxes A and B separated by distance D. And on the vertical axis, we've got time. These two arrows represent um, a signal sent for, from box A towards box B and from box B towards box A. And the signal is at a degree where the gradient um, is at the speed of light. Basically, it tells us that if a signal is sent from box A at this time, then it can reach B at this time. Similarly for B, if a signal is sent uh, at this time from B, then it will reach A at this time over here. And the travel time is given by the separation of the boxes D divided by the speed of light C. So, if we want to ensure that the lo uh, locality loophole is closed, we have this time interval D over C where outputs must be produced, and then we know that the loophole is closed, and our assumption of non-communicating boxes is valid. A different loophole is the detection loophole. We're going to run a finite number of experiments, so we must somehow make the assumption that the samples that we obtain in our experiment accurately reflect the reality. But there's problems with these assumptions. This assumption is also called fair sampling assumption. And that comes from two things. One is that detectors might be bad or we might have photon loss, so a box will simply not produce an answer. It will not produce plus one or minus one. In that case, we have to disregard this trial run and not include it in our statistics. This gives a very powerful tools to the boxes. They can simply select trials which contribute to Bell violation, even though Bell, violation is, uh, Bell inequality is not violated over the full set of trials. But this loophole can be closed as well. One, we can use highly efficient detectors, and we can use heralding entanglement creation. That means we have some other signal that tells us that yes, box A and B are sharing an entangled state, you can go ahead and try to gather your statistics for your Bell inequality for your correlations. Closing both loopholes is extremely challenging experimentally. There were experiments that demonstrated closing detectional loophole, but not closing the locality loophole, or vice versa. Until 2015, in the experiment by Hansen and collaborators, where they managed to close both loopholes. For their qubits, they used NV centers in diamond, and the experiment was carried out in the Netherlands at the Technical University of Delft. They close the locality loophole by separating the two qubits located here at location A and B by far enough, in this case close to 1.3 kilometers. And this gave them a time window of 4.27 microseconds. In this time window, the experimentalists ensured that the uh, choice for the measurement basis was made and the outputs of both measurements were produced effectively demonstrating that the assumption of non-communicating non um, qubits or boxes was valid. The second loophole, the detection loophole, was closed in the following way. They used an intermediate node C to herald that A and B were sharing entanglement. Hence, they knew that they were, uh, they were able to start the trial on an entangled state. Does this scenario sound familiar? where we are waiting for a confirmation from um, some intermediate node C uh, to tell A and B that they are sharing an entanglement. 
We talked about this in our link architectures. In fact, this is an MIM link, memory interference memory, or meet in the middle, meet in the middle uh, link architecture. So the qubit at A emitted a photon, and so did qubit at B. And those photons were collected into the fibers here given by these orange lines, or these yellow lines, and they met and interfered at a BSA at node C. This BSA performed a Bell's um, entanglement swapping measurement, Bell basis measurement, and if that was successful, the signal was sent to A and B. This way, the detection loophole was closed. Here's a few numbers that are of particular interest about this experiment. The total number of heralded Bell pairs generated during the duration of the run, or during the duration of the experiment, was 245. That's quite a few Bell pairs, but the entire a measurement time was 220 hours. This is an incredibly long time to get only 245 bell pairs. That just goes to show how difficult these experiments are. In fact, the success probability per entanglement generation attempt was 6.4 times 10 to the minus 9. So there, the experimentalists had to try many, many times in order to generate at least 245 bell pairs. The attenuation in the fiber was 8 dB per kilometer. Luckily, the fibers were not so long. Despite all of these uh, uh, complications, the experimentalists were able to demonstrate a clear violation of the Bell inequality. They measured S to be 2.42 plus or minus 0.2. This is our first experiment that shows you how to build an entangled link. In the next experiment, we're going to talk about three-node network.